All right, right. we right. have six o'clock and we're gonna go ahead and call our work session together. And before I turn it over to Dr. Howard, I know this is uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. We are so blessed in Jackson County to have so many dedicated educators that do such an outstanding job. So I just want to publicly say for us board members, thank you. We appreciate what all of you are doing. So all right, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, and I would like to second Ms. Wheeler's uh, thank you to our teachers, and, and you probably or may not even know this, but it's also um, Nurse Appreciation Week and School yes. uh, Lunch Service, or yes. our School oh, Nutrition okay. Appreciation okay. Week. So bottom line is we have amazing people invested in Jackson County student success, and so thanks to all of them, we mean that sincerely. So I have just a few comments before we'll get into the work. I do want to just make notice that uh, Mr. Cronick is not here today. He's with uh, his son who's competing in a FFA event and so he's with him and Mr. Clarice is at another meeting is going to join us as soon as he has finished with that engagement so that will give, give us we have a quorum now and we don't have any action items but just out of professional courtesy to let everybody know where those folks are they'll be uh, Mr. Clarice will be joining us and I just want to um, remind you that Monday night's board meeting will be held um, at Jackson County Conference of High School we have all been watching the weather very closely for a multitude of reasons this has been one of a very interesting weather season um, and so right now it looks like the weather's going to be very pretty on Monday and we plan to host our um, retirement reception in the courtyard area outside of the auditorium weather for me if something goes awry we're prepared to move it inside and have it inside the auditorium but we do have our meeting um, at 6 30 and we'll start the reception at 5 o'clock we have 26 retirees um, and we have 11 or 12 who have given more than 20 years of service to Jackson County Schools. So yeah. hundreds of years of service walking across that stage on Monday night. So we'll make sure that we honor those folks and we're looking forward to that, as well as some great student achievements that we're going to recognize, including our uh, young authors and so forth. That agenda is already in the assembly for your review, and so we'll highlight Jackson County and highlight our teachers and have a great evening. <coughs> but, but just a reminder there. And of course, we will not be meeting again before we have graduation. And so graduation at East Jackson High School is on the 23rd at 8 o'clock and at, at Jackson County um, on the 24th. Just so that you're aware, um, we've learned our lesson. We have a rain plan at both high schools. So <coughs> we are certainly hoping for a beautiful evening and a, an outdoor graduation, but it really worked out uh, kudos to um, the technology team and Dr. Jones and lots of people who made it happen indoors last year at Jackson County High School and it, it turned out very nice. And while we hope we can have it outside, we have a plan if we can't. So both East Jackson and Jackson County are prepared for an indoor graduation if that should be the case. So thank y'all for all your efforts and being ready for that. It's a special event for families and we wanna make sure it's a good experience. So um, those are really all the updates except to say, date the obvious, the month of May is full of excitement and opportunities and uh, turns loose a little bit at the end of the year. So we have folks here who have been running around the schools monitoring testing and field days, and we're not quite into field days yet. Those are the next week after we get finished with testing, and then we've got AP exams and uh, end of pathway assessments, a lot of things going on this month. So our schools are buzzing busy and working very hard, and so we wish them the very best and strength to them to stay positive and optimistic and have a strong finish, and I know they will. So. You'll see on the agenda, and for folks who are um, visiting, and most of us are regulars, but we have moved to an electronic platform, and I appreciate the suggestion from the board to move to an electronic platform. So the board doesn't have any printed materials, so be patient with us. If you if we have something that's that's not very re readable or you can't see it, we will we will adjust. But I think we're going to be just fine, and it's going to be a great way for us to ensure consistency in the fact that we got the right piece of paper because everybody's looking at the same. One of the things that we've been trying to do as a, as a board is make a commitment to reviewing our policies. And as you know, um, thus far, we've, we have reviewed and thoroughly talked about sections A, B, and C. And so I just want, Amanda is pulling it up there. You don't necessarily have to pull it up because you may not want to leave the meetings page. But if you look at the front page, you will see <coughs> on the far right-hand side assembly, there are about four revisions, four policies that have been revised. There are no it, there are no content revisions in terms of procedures, but there are a few revisions. For example, uh, meetings are chaired by a chairman, we just changed that to a chairperson. Um, and a vice chairperson, we've done some cleanup. So we would like to just 
you know, revisions that don't have any text, any uh, significant changes to the content. Um, we don't have to lay on the table for 30 days. So if you'll take a look at those local board councils, we did look at that. Uh, we simply took out the fact that we no longer have a regional evening school because that's that's just been removed. Um, if you want to look at the next one, Amanda, there is one I wanted to draw attention to the board. Um, I think it's the nepotism. Yes, nepotism. Uh, one of the board members asked a very good question in our in our conversations about that verbiage, um, system administrative uh, staff is what it's called, and that term administrative in private industry means oftentimes secretarial staff and like all staff. And so I called uh, legal counsel and they said, you may want to change it to district leadership and supervisory staff. The intent was not to prevent a secretary's spouse from being able, it would be someone who has a supervisory responsibility. So for clarity, um, instead of it being administrative, which people perceive sometimes as a clerical position, it being a leadership supervisory role. So that's the uh, only clarification there that came with nepotism. And then I think there was one, three more, I know. Yes, that, we're, we're gonna talk about those today. So that's one that um, Anna uh, suggested, so we'll talk about those in just a minute. Anna's not here, her sister's getting married in South Florida, so she'll have to leave to go be a part of that wedding party as she should be, but Erin is here and we're grateful and she's prepared to work with us. So if you'll look over the policies that we've already revised, um, that's sections A, B, and C, so we'll be ready to have those all updated and they're in e-board as well, or excuse me, assembly <laughs> as well. Tonight we were scheduled and are scheduled to look at sections D, E, and F, and so I'd like to suggest that we partner like we did last time and each of us take, each of the three of us take a section. There are not many, um, not many policies really in here. Uh, whoever gets F gets the, gets the easy one, right? <laughs> so Amanda, she's already quit mine. Uh, Ted, did you have a, do you have a thought about how you might want to go through these? Ted has already gone through these and most of these fall in the operations, but we talked about teaming up again or do you want to just talk through them? Well, I our team looked at the policies for uh, student school bus transportation, for school nutrition management, and for the wellness program. And in those three, we found no, we have no recommendations for changes. I found one word needs a Y on the end, which is a typographical error, but I think we can do that without board approval. Uh, but we didn't have any recommendations because they're, they're relatively straightforward. They, Transportation Department, for instance, uh, follows state guidelines. That's really the key to it. It says that in the policy, and it says we're to concentrate on safety and the training of our drivers, and Mr. Farmer and his staff do a great job with that. And Dr. Morris has looked at the uh, school nutrition management, and again, it, it has to follow very specifically federal and state guidelines, and we didn't have any recommendations there. So. The wellness program, I think, also stands as it is. It's, it's uh, put together well. We just need to implement a little bit more uh, in that structure, but no changes to the process itself. So from our standpoint, I don't necessarily recommend a breakdown. We're welcome to meet with you, but we don't have any changes to recommend. It seems like it covers everything too well. Uh, you were saying we need to implement something else. What else do you think? In the wellness expand? program, we, yeah. we are doing a lot with health and wellness across the district, um, but in terms of meeting the specifics of this policy, I think we just need to uh, bring a few stakeholders in that we haven't had before. Mm -hmm. uh, over this past year, we had a number that moved away, uh, and so yeah. they aren't in the district anymore, so okay. we just need to restructure that, and our goal is to do that at our operations retreat on June 12th, um, kind of in combination with safety committee. So one of the biggest response, there are many big responsibilities of being a board member, we've already taxed your time a lot, but one of the biggest responsibilities, as you know, is the fiduciary responsibility. So section D is primarily budget items. So I think it might be worthwhile if you, if we could click through those and just make sure. DC is the annual operating budget. There's very little there, but do understand that there's, your level of budgetary control is explained there. And Aaron, if you have any <coughs> insight that you want to share, you please share. We follow those policies clearly, and you know that you see the, the budget um, at these levels. You see the fund function and object level, and we control it at that, um, that level here. So, and at any given time, I have to tell you that 
there's a whole lot more supporting documentation that goes with the budget, as you know. And at any time, Aaron and Anna are happy to share that with you. We don't give you everything, because if we did, with all object codes, it would be hundreds of pages. But at any time, if you're interested about any specific program, you're welcome to come and see that. So that's uh, DC. DCL is fund balance, and I won't read that to you, um, but I think that's, quite frankly, we've done a really, really good job, and it clearly says that we have a responsibility to keep financial stabilization and to ensure that we um, have a restricted number of dollars to for certain um, areas, and, and we do that, and you'll be happy when, sh when Aaron gets to share our, in, if you've not already looked at where we are right now in terms of our accumulated fund balance, so I don't see, and Anna has read all of these, Aaron has reviewed them, there are no changes, but I think it's important for new board members to understand that it is in policy that we maintain a, an appropriate fund balance. Um, DIB is financial reports, and this is one that had a very minor revision, um, and it's simply, <laughs> A change at the end that changes from operations as the term for the director to the uh, CFO. Mm -hmm. So that was just a basically an operating change in the verbiage there. But you can see um, pretty clear explanation in what you have said in terms of capitalization for fixed assets and approval processes. So that's one if you've not read pretty carefully. DIB is one that I would take some time to to read over. And some questions that you have, uh, for example, surplus and depreciation of fixed assets, those kinds of things that you probably want to be relatively knowledgeable of. So, um, and we'll take any questions that you have that you may want to read over at first, and then if you have any questions, come back uh, to us. And then um, DK is a student activities account, and that um, is school-based accounting. So if you want to speak to that at all, Erin? That the schools have their own set of books and bank accounts that they operate with, and that's what's referred to in this, and it is separate from ours. You completely know, tell them how to spend it. They, you know, the purpose the, for which the money is collected is how they are supposed to spend it. We can support them and help them follow policies and learn new ones as they grow, um, but it is the principal's discretion that is not ours. And those accounts are audited as well on an annual basis, mm -hmm. and they do they do random, I mean, they audit all of them, but then they do it more in depth on random schools periodically. So we, we make sure we have an audit system in place for school-based accounting as well. Should we add uh, he and she on that third line down? Mm -hmm. He shall, I think, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Amanda, do you got Hoyer? I just don't have a, let's help me remember that. We'll make a note of that, DK, um, for anybody. Yeah, because the last revision on this was 2004. <laughs> <laughs> We got so some cheese now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. So that's those particular uh, policies. And um, if you have any questions, again, we can lay these on the table till June. Um, in June, we'll be beginning our work with personnel policies, section G. And those are, there's a lot of those, and those are a little more heavy lifting. And bring a snack. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was glad we didn't have that one tonight, too, when I was looking over there. There's so. the last one. Um, Ted, do you want to speak to the last one? I'll be glad no, to. No, but yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's the non-controversial naming of a school. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. If you look above, behind you or on your, your uh, devices, you'll see that essentially the Board of Education has a sole responsibility to name just about anything. And I think the intent is just that, whether it's a building, a stadium, in a room. Uh, so we are, as, as you know, moving forward pretty rapidly with the new high school, and we will need to establish sooner than later a name. Other than new yes. high school. <laughs> yes. Right now it's new West High School because that's what the architect put on the plans, but it's, yeah. it's just a descriptor. So, uh, but there's lots that we have to go through the process from uh, logos and colors and whether it's a gym floor, or whether it's a sign out front, signage throughout, it's very important. So you can't really finish the design until exactly. we have it. So we probably need to do that in the next uh, month. Next month. Next Saturday. 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 Yeah. Did you say how? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it goes yeah. without saying that this can be a little bit of a, um, that it's an opportunity, but it can be, everybody has a different opinion, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I'm 
open to whatever the board is, it wants to do. One thing that we know happened with the naming of East Jackson High School was a little bit of community involvement and conversation. Um, I think you all need to decide whether or not we batted around the idea of limiting it to the three or four that were brainstormed at the re Do you remember our retreat two years yeah. ago? The board, but it wasn't our sitting board, it was the previous board, mm -hmm. came up with about, I think, five to six potential names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we wanted to revisit that and potentially do a one-week survey just to get feedback from the community on how they feel, um, the other option is for the board just to, to go into a conversation and decide what you want to name it. Um, I shared, since Mr. Chronic was not going to be here, he called me today, I, I mentioned to him that that topic was going to come up. His opinion at this point, having not been a part of a full board conversation, was I think that probably just needs to be a board conversation and a board decision. So I do think it's something um, that we need to talk about. Um, and maybe you all can help me walk through that. The other piece of it to be thinking about, we have plenty of time for this, that as we build the Empower College and Career Center, if we are able and fortunate enough to get capital investments from large companies, might the board entertain the idea of there being a company name as a part of a lab? If they build that lab, that would be the, that, that would be a naming issue. So we need to be thoughtful about how we move forward with capital investment and the naming of, of any part of the facility as well. So uh, nothing we have to deal with right now in terms of power, but food for thought. We do need to get pretty um, decisive on I'll look to you. It might be something that we want to discuss briefly um, the board meeting or after the board meeting Monday since, Mr. since the whole board will be there um, and at least decide the next step so that by June we can be ready to make a decision. Um, any thoughts, Mr. Crawler or Ms. Anglin or Ms. Wheeler on your general uh, thinking there? Well, I think in order to, if it's, you know, if it's going to be a community, um, I think the community needs to be involved. At least, you know, I understand if we have some names already, we want to steer them a little maybe, but I think it's important that they have some input. Have some input at least. <laughs> well, and I know when we had talked about this before, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're actually moving Jackson County High School to the new facility, and there's even been some discussion about keeping that same name. Sure. We certainly want them to continue to be Panthers, you know, and if we change the name, I hadn't even thought about this until someone else mentioned it at the time, that it will change everything as far as athletics and the fine arts department, you know, if it's... Um, All the uniforms for everything. Yes, <laughs> yes. And see, I hadn't even thought about that yeah. either. Um, so anyway, I think we, we do need to have a little time talking about that. logo that's JC, you know, so mm -hmm. that would be, and all that stuff is pretty expensive to mm -hmm. purchase, mm -hmm. and they have to raise the money to purchase those. We can't use taxpayer money for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that would be an extra expense. Yeah. 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 I'm interested to hear what the, our two guys from that side sure. say. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So. Alright, so we'll, maybe we'll find some time after the board meeting to yeah. know it's open meeting. Whoever wants to stay and stay in the so we don't need to I think we can talk about it and at least determine the next steps. We won't necessarily be in a position to make any decision. But I appreciate you letting us bring that forward a little bit. We need to, <laughs> need to give the architects and the designers some, some clarity on that. So, and I didn't mean to delay it. We just were waiting for our board to get to a place that we were ready for all of us to be together. So that helps us. I think that pretty much, um, if you will read through those policies, if you haven't already, if there's any additional questions that you have, we'll make that revision. And already made one small revision to CFO and uh, we'll just continue this process and look forward to Dr. Blankenship walking us through personnel in June. So that will be up to that yeah. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. Policy is Something not to look forward That's right. It's not a lot of fun, but it's really, really important, especially when you find yourself trying to make a decision on something that could be um, yeah, All right. Leadership and performance. As we mentioned, we're right in the middle of testing season, so would be remiss, you probably are going to do it, but I want to send a very special thank you to Martha and our technology team as well. Martha did a whole lot of, whole lot of preparation, and it has been an outstanding administrative process, and technology has been so
exceptional in support, and so thank y'all very much. Uh, I'll let you all speak to some of the preliminary <coughs> map data, which is our own assessment system, former system. And, and I do want to uh, follow up your thanks with another thank you, because not only has the testing been, and I, you always said, I don't believe in jinxing, but I <laughs> never want to say it, I know. but but the Why process has, has improved substantially over time. But the fact that you also allowed us to kind of fast track the purchasing of those Chromebooks, that I can say without jinxing anything. Rusty didn't have to, as he's year, in years past, um, pack up Chromebooks, bring them to another school. I mean, it just makes things so much easier to, to the point where our schools actually had four or five extra Chromebooks per hall. So if a child had an issue, they could just grab the Chromebook, give the child the new Chromebook, and then, then our, our technology team could figure out the problem. So I mean, it was just seamless. And, Few years ago, no. that wasn't an option. That Chromebook's not working and not taking the test right now. So thank you for that. It's gotten, uh, it's really expedited our, our testing process and, and made it a little bit more relaxing in terms of taking that stress out. Uh, as Dr. Howard mentioned, we do have map data. We also have some milestones data that's coming in, but I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Johnson to do the bars and diamonds presentation that, that I used to do years ago, and he is our map guru, so he's gonna give you a preliminary update with the understanding that in June, if not July, we will dig much more deeply into your performance because all mm -hmm. this is um, pretty early still. Pretty early and um, our school leaders just got access to the district-wide relative comparisons this week when we closed our map window last week. Um, adding on to what you said, Dr. Howard, uh, we're just very thankful to all of our leaders in the building from the classroom uh, all the way up to the principals and the assistant principals and all those who uh, work with students and parents and kids and all their hard work these last couple of weeks. Uh, when you think about where we are right now, we've just closed out, um, tomorrow we'll finish up our end of grade assessments that we give K through eight. As a district, we've given right at, it's a little bit of an approximation, 10,000 end of grade tests if you look at those individual and those all been facilitated on computers. Our, our students in grades three, four, and six and seven take the English language arts test, which is broken up into three parts, and then the math test, which is broken up into two parts. And then uh, for our students in fifth grade and eighth grade, they take the English language arts and math versions along with the science and social studies. So um, uh, our students have uh, worked very hard, and then our, our counterparts at the high school and then also our advanced eighth graders have been taking those high school versions uh, of the end of course tests and they've started with that this week and that's been going well and they'll be concluding uh, in the next couple of days and on inward into the next week. Uh, but our team has done a great job of supporting uh, buildings and school leaders and uh, we're just going to get better. Uh, we did start getting some preliminary data coming in on science and social studies for our elementary and middle school students. Uh, we won't be able to share that until much later in the summer until uh, with the district uh, publicly with our stakeholders um, until the, it's no longer embargoed. But uh, what we hope to is that as soon as next week, we'll start seeing the math and the uh, language arts data. And once we get all that in, we've been in communication with our schools. We've sent them some sample letters that they can use to go ahead and send those scores home because many of our parents will want to know and the kids want to know. So we'll be communicating and can communicate with individual families. Um, and then uh, teachers are anxious to look and see what are their areas that they, they've seen a lot of success, and then also those areas where they may need to focus on. And that leads us right into our map data. So this is a report, as Mr. Uh, Nicholson referred to, that we sometimes call our, our stars and bars. And Ms. Amanda, if you'll scroll it down for a second. And I just, we're gonna use this one to orient, and then we're gonna go back to the agenda, and we're gonna look at a side-by-side -side comparison of last year's data to this year's data. Um, what the diamond, that orange golden diamond represents for each grade level is based on their fall score. So for example, when we look at our kindergarten students right here, based on how they scored in fall, uh, they take the data nationwide and they look and see based on kindergarten's growth, this is how our students should have grown over the course of the year. And as you can see, the bar that is actually how our students did perform in terms of their growth. So anytime our bar is well above that diamond, that means our students are growing at a faster rate than they were participating in. We've got several areas where you can see right here where our diamond, our bar exceeds our diamond, 
or is right there in line with it. Um, and that's one part of the story. Uh, what we can say right now as far as math is for the most part district-wide kindergarten through eight where we utilize math testing. Our students are performing, if not right on track with where they are with the rest of the nation or well above it. Um, and when we look at the side-by-side -side comparisons, uh, we'll, we'll talk about where we are now compared to where we were last year. <laughs> if you'll scroll down real quick, Ms. Amanda. Um, when you look at reading, um, in kindergarten again, you'll sit and notice that same trend that we saw with math. Um, in first grade, uh, we'll talk about this here in a second, we're a little bit beneath where our projection is, but we've also had a substantial change in our curriculum this year and been changing some things up. And uh, we're digging in that deeper and we'll be working with our teachers. Right now, we don't want to pull any teachers or leaders out of the building with them doing through the milestones testing, but looking and getting down to if there are any root causes. Um, when we look second, third, fifth grades, we see we're growing above that projected rate. And then in a couple of the other areas, we're going to see that our, we're still not quite there where we are when we look at that national average for growth. And if you're going down to language arts, um, you're going to see there's some places here where we've got some gaps that we've got to work on. But like I said, when you just look at it for one testing season and one testing administration, it doesn't let you kind of look at where were we to where we are right now. So if you'll go back to the agenda, and for everyone that's got your agenda pulled up online, I'm going to ask that you click on this first document right here, which says JCSS Spring Map Growth. And uh, it's got a cover slide. And then the second page of that document, when you scroll to it, you'll actually see a side-by-side -side comparison of our district data based on spring of last year to spring of this year, looking at student growth. Uh, we've highlighted in green. These are the grade levels that we have seen increases over last year um, in those grade levels. And then in gold, fifth through seventh with math. While we're definitely right there within the national average, we had a couple places where we had a few dips, some a little bit more than others. And our, our teachers and our, our teacher leaders and uh, system and school leaders are working on that pace and looking into it. The other thing we have to take into consideration too is that these, this year's fifth graders were also last year's fourth graders. And you look, for example, where last year's fourth graders were as a cohort, they didn't meet. They weren't even, uh, they were well beneath their diamond as far as growth. And when you see this year, they actually, that subgroup of students are above their diamond. So, you know, you've got to look at it fifth to fifth, but also looking in terms of those fourth going to fifth. Um, you know, there's always multiple stories when you get down and digging into it. Um, but definitely, when you well, look at how we that's perform. That's true of sixth grade too, isn't yes, it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So again, um, you know, a lot of times when people look at the milestones, and that's why I like to give this comparison, um, people are really quick to say, well, your third grade scores dropped, or your fourth grade scores dropped. Well, what are we talking about in reference to? Are we talking about third grade to third grade last year to third grade this year? Because those are two different groups of kids. Yeah. Um, I can say from being a building level leader and a classroom teacher, sometimes you'll have a group of kids. A curriculum may have changed back in third grade or fourth grade, and that sometimes can lead to a little dip that we continue to work with for a couple of years to close in those gaps. But um, overall, when we look at math, if you think to three years ago, the diamonds were here and the bars were here. So. For three years synopsis, where we are, we've gotten a lot better. And we've seen a lot more growth, and uh, we're, we're very interested in waiting to see when the results come back from the end of grade and the end of course to see if we're gonna see that in the achievement level as well. Looking at our reading data, again, we pointed out a while ago there are a couple of places when we can see that our bars had not quite reached that diamond on that national average for growth. However, when you look, for example, eighth grade, look at where we were compared to last year to where we were this year in spring. Um, also, when you look at those seventh grade students last year to where they are right now. So they were beneath their growth targets for last year, but now they're right in line with those growth targets. 
So, uh, again, first grade, we do know, and I will have to say, it's not necessarily always system-wide, so we're looking at particular schools. Uh, there are multiple factors that come into play. Um, attrition, hiring of new teachers, years of experience, um, changing curriculums. As Mr. Nicholson reminds me a lot of times, it's, it's not easy to sit there and just pinpoint causation as just one factor, but then working with those buildings to not only identify what the challenge might have been, but then what are we going to do about it? Because we can sit there and look at data all the time. Milestones are great autopsy data. I say that a little sarcastically because by the time we get them at the end of the year, you know, it, it's done. It, you, you might have a couple of days, what are you going to do about it? Whereas this, we're able to get the growth projections fall, winter, and spring. We can then look at it and then make adjustments as needed. And then, Mr. Thomas, it's probably worth noting that we administer the spring map earlier this year so that we could do just that, so the teachers could get the data. And, they, and when you get that, the report for the students and you look at the learning continuum and profile, you can really target those areas where they're struggling the most. So whereas in the past, we kind of had the spring uh, right around the time of the milestones. And, and that came from our teachers asking if we could do that. Mm -hmm. and, and Martha and scheduling made that happen. So we want that diamond. We want the, the we want our blue bar, very, but we want it to be in the very center of that diamond or the top of that. We'd diamond. love it to be above it. I know, but but if we're gonna be, um, where that diamond it's gonna is, be in the center. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Where where that diamond is, that is the projection based on, for example, the national average for all kindergartens yeah. that take math, which are thousands. Mm -hmm. When they look at what the typical growth of a kindergartner is. Um, then we look in terms of where our growth is. Yeah. So, and there again, there's when you talk about a typical kindergartner, it's like saying there's no cookie cutters out there as well. Um, and I can remember the principal three years ago when Mr. Nicholson came to me and said, Mr. Johnson, you're going to do math testing, you're going to do it with kindergartners. I was like, what? Um, and I remember the first time we did that with our kids, it was, a, it was interesting, um, hurting cats sometimes a little bit, but now to the point that our teachers, when we hire a new kindergarten teacher, whether they're a veteran or a new teacher, and they'll come in and they'll have that same, huh, we're gonna test kindergartens at the end of the year, and the teacher's like, you'll love it. And they're like, it gives you great data. To the point now, Martha can tell you, we've got kindergarten teachers that have told us, can we get math test them at Roundup? And we're like, wait, wait that oh. might not be the, the first teacher, but the data they get is so powerful. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. And then lastly, with language arts, again, um, you can see we had considerable gaps uh, the previous year between our performance overall as a system in terms of growth um, and where we projected that growth to be. Um, there's still some places where we've got some gaps, but we've you know, closed many of those in fourth, fifth uh, grades, we're, we're well above, and then others, we, we've closed down that number. Uh, also uh, available in the links in there, we put individual school data. Uh, we're not going to go through each one of those right now, um, but for example, we've got some schools where we've seen substantially high growth. Um, we're also looking at that through the lens of achievement uh, because that gives us an idea about supports. Because when we look and prioritize, I mean, as we continue to get larger and larger as a system, we want to use our money efficiently and support that. So this helps us prioritize needs in terms of maybe do we have a school or is it a grade level or even a particular area or subgroup of students. So this is kind of giving you a very global view, but uh, within our individual subgroups, for example, our ESOL teachers that support our students that are new to the, either the United States or native, speak a native language other than English, we can pull just their data or our students with disabilities. Um, our gifted students. That's one of the questions we saw at my school a couple of years ago is when we started looking at it, we were like, our gifted kids were not growing as fast as some of our other students. And what we found is that um, for some people, the, the thought was, well, can gifted kids grow as fast as a kid that's not gifted? And the answer is yes, they can. Um, and it's not as much of a gotcha for teachers. I think when we first went to it, there was still a little bit of skepticism out there, like, what are we measuring? Now they come back and like, oh no, we can stretch this student further. Or when you've got a student that may be coming into fourth grade and they're starting reading that year at a second grade level, you can sit there when the year's over with and 
Ideally, we, yes, we want to pass the milestone study of assessment. We want every kid to be successful in that matter. However, within the MAP system, we can also sit there and say, you know what? You didn't quite make it to that fourth grade reading benchmark, but you went from a second grade level at the beginning of the year to a 3.5. And you've grown a year and a half in a year's worth of time. So um, all in all, like we said, when we looked at the growth trends, we saw some very promising results in the work that we're doing. Um, what we hope to share with y'all in the next coming months is the achievement piece too as well, so we can look where we are. Um, it gives us some very unique predictors in terms of alignment and uh, what we want to be able to share is what the predictions were versus what the actual outcomes were for the milestones. And as Mr. Nicholson said, we actually gave it about two weeks ahead of when we have been doing it in the past. And the teacher said, we want to go ahead and start giving it before spring break so when they can come back to spring break, if they identified any hot spots and areas of focus, versus also they said, if I see an area that's a really strong strength, I may not need to review on that or only for a couple of few students. So it really let uh, teachers and, and parents and students prioritize those needs. There's more data there, and like, like you shared, as, as we get more data, we'll share it with you. Um, and, and I appreciate all the work that goes into this. Lots and lots of detail. The exciting thing for me is that teachers are slowly and realizing that formative data like this helps them to personalize how they teach students. That's the key to all of this. Sorry, Todd. That's right. Well, I was, I she took what I was about to say. That's well, okay. I, I, I did fail to mention one thing. One of our teachers, Miss Whitney Wilson, uh, who is at East Jackson Elementary School. Uh, MAP is national, it's actually a worldwide company uh, now, nonprofit. Uh, she entered a contest, uh, she was recommended, uh, and they were actually wanting to know how teachers out there were gearing students up for taking the MAP and getting them excited about taking the MAP. So uh, they did several different activities. One of them, they were doing surgery on sentences and she converted her classroom into an operating room and kids came in and scrubs. She shared what she did. Uh, they picked three winners nationwide, and she was one of the nationwide winners. So, wow. no. when people yeah. talk about only yeah, in Jackson on County, yeah. um, one of our she own was great. recognized nationwide yes. for what they're doing to support students' growth. Yeah. Very good. All right. Professionalism. So, then that was going to be my segue because personalization is really that. That is one of the three. It's one of the five goals. <coughs> one of the three goals that teaching and learning focuses our time and energy on, and that has allowed us to, to have some of that formative data to really personalize. But we're trying to personalize for our adults as well. And so Amanda, if you don't mind, I think I'll go to the second document first because that's a little bit more of an overview. Last year, was, as Mr. Johnson mentioned, we, we did do, uh, we rolled out some new curriculum materials and language arts. And our elementary teachers spent a lot of time with us during the summer. And we knew by design that that would be the case, but they're not gonna have to spend nearly as much time with us this summer. Most of our work is, when you do a big rollout like that, you do need to establish a foundation, a baseline. Most of our work this summer is with design teams, which is an extension of our design thinking work. And so folks are now going out and they're building prototypes. They're, it's, it's work that we've done in the past, but it's, it's got a, a little uh, enhanced level of sophistication, I think, because it's, it's going to be housed in a different way and shared in a different way, which I'll explain to you. But, but what we've done is we have representation from grade bands at schools, and we have design teams with, with all the content areas. We have design teams that um, each one is doing something a little bit different, but it all comes from the feedback that we've received throughout the pro professional learning throughout the course of the year, as well as some of the feedback we've received through advanced ed. So as they come together, teachers will actually be building out curriculum repositories, and we're gonna put that in Canvas, which is our learning management system. The nice thing about that is where we've had stuff on what used to be a shared drive at one point, uh, some people could save, some people could access, they couldn't. We moved to Google, that was fantastic. But as people started becoming very savvy with Google, they realized that they probably didn't have things locked down as much as they should have when we started. And so in Canvas, you can you put what you, you put the, the primary documents in there. People can pull them down, but they can't they can't change folders, they can't you can't lose the document. And what, what we'll be able to do is when a new teacher comes on board, we'll actually be able to say after we finish all this work, it won't be won't be with this group necessarily, but we'll be able to say here is your, here's every course. It's not going to be if you're a third grade teacher that you don't have access to fourth. It's not going to be that if you're a biology teacher you don't have access to seventh grade life science. Here are all of our courses and I think we've showed y'all in the past our portal 
but now our portal will link into Canvas so that teachers will have their curriculum maps, their instructional frameworks, if they're common assessments built into it, direct links out to resources. So really, you have everything you need to, to, to it's not necessarily uh, prescriptive to how to teach the, the course, but you have all the resources, because I still think teaching is an art, and it, it, it's not something that we just mandate you teach in a specific way, but you have everything you need at your fingertips, which I'm really excited about that. And those are our repository courses, and so that's a lot of the work that's happening during the summer. We also have some folks, mostly in middle and high school, that are building what we're calling blueprint courses, and that is really more of a course designed for a student to take. And, and part of that idea is that we, we need to start putting our courses in so that now that we're getting one-to-one -one at several of our schools, that that is an option. If a student wants to work at a slightly faster pace, if a student is at home due to a, an, an injury or a long-term illness, if a student wants to be able to have access to, to curriculum because they just, I mean, they know what they want to do and they're driven, that we can start to remove the, the barriers of, of consistent time and place and having those being the, 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 the factors that dictate how students learn. And so with Canvas, with our middle and high school teachers, they'll start building out these blueprint courses that a teacher can actually pull down. They could teach all the content face-to-face. -face. They could teach some of it uh, through a blended learning where you have face-to-face -face and you have students online. And if it was appropriate, you could teach it completely online if that was, uh, if that was a needed case. So we've been talking about our LMS for a while, but now that we actually have devices, uh, West Middle's one-to-one, -one, South Jackson's one-to-one, -one, Maysville, one to one, Jackson County High School is going to be one to one, and, and so Jackson County High School, we're we're going to be doing a lot of pilot work there. What does that look like in high school? It's probably worth letting you know that, uh, unlike in middle school, where you can come in, pick up your device at the end of the day, drop it off because your schedule is set up that way. That we have to explore, and, and Mr. Summer and I are, are working through this with Dr. Jones. Does that mean students take home their devices? Because in high school, you don't you don't start the day and end the day in the same place, and so. We've got, a, we've got a really awesome opportunity to work with Jackson County High School to figure that out. And eventually all of our schools will be one-to-one, -one. not even eventually, not, I'm not too far away. Very soon. So my point behind that too is that the professional learning this summer is very much personalized. There are, there are options for teachers. There's not nearly, there's really nothing that's mandated this year. It's would you like some additional support with Fonta Sipinel? Would you like some additional support with the things that we rolled out, and most of the work is is bringing teacher leaders and experts together to build out curriculum resources. So that's the that's one document. The other document is again personalizing as much as we can for new employees. We have new teacher orientation, and you've got July dates that are right there before the school starts. But we've also provided some June dates, so as folks come and they, they go through the onboarding, if they're available on June 17 and 18th. They can go ahead and they can do a combination of June dates, all June dates, June and July dates, because if you're new to teaching or new to Jackson County and, and you're coming on board and you've got to learn all the new curriculum resources and, and how we do it in Jackson County and then how we, I do it at my particular school within Jackson County, it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. So we're trying to provide them with, not trying, we are going to provide them with the opportunity to be able to come in and become more familiar. They can't come in June, that's fine. Uh, but if they come in June, then they don't have to do part, part of those July dates and so they've got some time to, to digest what they've learned and actually come back to the school with very specific questions about the curriculum and resources that they've learned about. And so that, that's kind of a, a combination of what we've done, what we did last year as well. And, and we've been modifying this process <coughs> the last couple of years, but I feel really good about it. And they, they get these dates when they come through on, on boarding. And, mm -hmm. and so they have that opportunity. The other thing is that because there's two sets of dates and they meet, they meet you know, our content specialists, they can do day one in June and do day, ju uh, day two in July if need be, and then they can come back and ask that content specialist with very specific questions like, I listened to all that, but when I really dug into it, here's what I'm wondering now. So that they don't have to wait until school starts and they've got their counterparts. They have some opportunity with, with teaching and learning team to do that during the summer. <coughs> so that's our, our overview for summer professional learning and our new teacher orientation. And that, I think, concludes everything for Leadership Did you Learning. Did you learn? I just want to reiterate to the board, um, if you're picking up here on the sense that our need to become more flexible with time and place is accelerating, I met with the Empower Board on Tuesday. They meet the first Tuesday of every month. And um, they had a great meeting, but they were asking lots of great questions. And the reality is our kids are going to a world that time and place is not fixed. 
So this Canvas platform, we've got kids that could very easily go into a U.S. history class that's scheduled to be all, long, all year long, but they may be finished with it November or December. So we've got to, they're depending upon the child, and we're not encouraging kids to rush through anything, but we also have kids that walk into kindergarten, some can read on the third grade level, and some don't know their letters. And so we ask our teachers to differentiate like that at the high school level. We're gonna have to start differentiating the same way so that kids understand that when they get into the world, there's a lot of flexibility and time in place. So we're just gonna have to continue to be open-minded about how we truly meet kids where they are and encourage them to move at their pace. Um, and it's gonna be exciting. It's gonna be challenging, but it's gonna be exciting. Well, Thank likewise, you. the child who is, is struggling a little That's bit right. more, when you have it in campus, you've got the course right there. So any other adult, any other colleague, anybody can still support, unlike the, you know, what is it that you're struggling with? Well, I don't know. You can go and you, you can look specifically in the course, and, and that, that that pace might be different than the, that's the right. pace. We that's don't all have to walk lockstep at the same time because they don't learn like that. It allows some learning at your pace, so we're excited about that. Definitely. Dr. Blankenship, human resources. It's not a busy season for human resources no. at all. We, but you've got great news. I've got great news. Um, we have, I, I don't have the latest total in front of me um, of, of how many we have hired. I'll give you an update on that last, um, <coughs> last month. But the, more important piece is that as of today, we only have about seven positions left to fill, and we have three or four of those in progress. So um, keeping our fingers crossed, if we you know have no more resignations, we should be finished with our hirings uh, very very soon. With and that, some hard to fill. I mean, some like really hard to fill positions. Yes. Health sciences. Um, I mean, we've got mm -hmm. some really good people for some yeah. really difficult yeah. positions. We, we do, and um, I am very excited about our new hires. We have a, a very nice mix of new teachers, veteran teachers uh, who are coming to us with some great experiences, phenomenal recommendations from their previous schools. You know, you always want to hear when you call for a reference. Oh, we're heartbroken that we're losing this teacher, you know, because you know that they've, they've been good for kids. Right. So we're very excited about that. We've had our first onboarding session uh, with the first 20 or so um, new employees. In a very unique day. <laughs> yeah, on a very unique day. They are, the, they are the, the only and hopefully only ever group that can say that they came in and experienced a, a tornado warning and it wasn't a drill. So <laughs> they, they, all they were all they were here in David's office. <laughs> yep. We took them all back to the you know we followed our Bus protocol. Shop. So <laughs> I said, you know now when when you go to your school and people are saying, why do we have to do these drills? You can say, I know why. Let me tell you <laughs> about onboarding. Yeah. So um, it, but they were all good sports. It was a, a, a great <coughs> experience and our HR staff here does a tremendous job of, of helping those Employees understand what their um, their benefits and payroll and contracts and all all of those things um, look like. So we have our next two sessions are on May 23rd. So that's a busy busy day because we'll have an onboarding session in the morning, an onboarding session in the afternoon, and graduation in the evening. <laughs> so um, so I'm going to eat my Wheaties that day. That's fine. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through some of this information that we have here. And I, I, I'm kind of excited because I usually don't get to talk a whole lot. I feel like I've got a lot to talk about this month. Um, our enrollment overview, I won't say much other than to say we're, you know, we've stayed, a, we've had a healthy um, enrollment all year long. It's stayed pretty steady. We saw some increases at the beginning of the year. We're up about three and a half percent over the year. And, um, the majority of that came at the beginning of the year. I am um, a little anxious about what the beginning of this next year will look like uh, based on the, uh, the growth that we know that's happening in all of the construction in, in uh, our West Jackson area. So uh, we're gonna, Tim and I are, are partnering and working very closely on, on those numbers. So, uh, and North Jackson. It, yeah, well, that, that whole yeah, that zone, the whole area. west zone. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Um, yes so, um, so North Jackson really is probably our biggest concern because right now that's our fastest growing school. Uh, 
I'd say are our smallest. So when you look at you know percentage wise, it, even if they grow just a little bit, they're, they're growing yeah. fast. So um, so we'll keep our eyes on that, and we certainly will um, come to you if we see any um, urgent needs uh, in any areas. But we are um, we're watching that closely. Um, we also have the attendance update and. North Jackson again not only are they fast growing they also come to school so they have the highest uh, percentage of attendance for this uh, month of April. Dr. B if I could interject there yes. I think that's a very deliberate effort that they've made mm -hmm. and I and, and kudos to North it Jackson is. leadership and teachers because they, they were not here last year but they put some things in place and it's paid off so it's exciting. Absolutely. Governor um, approved in, in his budget a $3,000 increase on the certified salary schedule, mm -hmm. and that's to the base salary, so it's a permanent increase. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, adjusted our local salary schedule uh, accordingly. And then a 2% increase for all other staff. And so we adjusted our non-teaching salary schedule accordingly there. So what you have um, attached are the certified salary schedule that we're proposing, the non-teaching salary schedule that we're proposing, and the supplements, so, uh, the supplement schedule. So if, if we want to take a look at those. Um, so is, is that automatic? Is it automatically given that 2%? Is it automatically given to, to everyone? It, it 3, we are adding that, that 2%, uh, 2% to, to all other staff that are not on the certified salary schedule. Yeah, it's not based on evaluation or anything. No, no, it's, it's, okay. it's, yeah. it's on the salary yeah. schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Unique to your government. Yes, yes. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The only place that we have the not as of right now for performance increases is really in our ranges for athletic performance and really okay. the performance based mm -hmm. high school. Right. So if we look at let's start with the certified salary schedule and so um, it's the, the only differences here from the previous salary schedule are the additional three thousand onto the base salary and then of course because our local supplement is a percentage of that base salary you know there there is a slight increase there and, and Anna has uh, has included all of that in, in her um, proposed budget number I'll say we're, we're very competitive. We are very competitive in terms of the, the supplement. So thank you to the board for I think it has helped us to attract. The it really has been trying to attract a lot. Um, sometimes it's not as easy to compete with uh, because there is a lot of flexibility now in um, what teachers are paid um, with with uh, strategic waiver systems and charter systems. Most ways the salary schedule 
community still follow the state salary schedule or they have some variation of it. Um, and so we have the way we've structured our supplement uh, on our salary schedule has allowed us to be um, competitive with some of those other systems who have a little more money than we yeah. do. And so, um, the non-teaching salary schedule, let's take a look at that next. You're going to see, I've tried to make a, a clarifying notes out to the side. So any additions to the salary schedule, um, what you have is the, the grades and then the step ranges for the for each grade, then the minimum and maximum salary on that grade. So if you're reading from left to right and just looking at grade one, you see grade one, that's a range of step one to step 11, and then minimum 12301 to 15520. Um, you'll have the number of days and then uh, on further add some codes that we have to have for, um, for our financial purposes and accounting purposes, and then the position. So where we have approved job descriptions along the way uh, throughout the year, we now have then gone and added them to the salary schedule or adjusted them based on the adjustments that were made with the job description. So for instance, uh, we have tonight, we have a more job descriptions for you to um, to look over and approve and one of those is an assistant food service manager which is a, a position Dr. Morris um, would like us to consider for some of our schools um, that have that need and uh, so you can see the note out beside it just says new job description submitted for approval by 2019 so each of these um, has a description out beside it and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about those. Well, and I think we just might, should note, since we've got some new folks, food service has to pay for themselves. They do. That doesn't come out of our tax dollars. It's um, self-sustaining. Yeah, they have to provide. Okay, so, all right. Does that make sense? It does. So, a lot of that, the, um, so state reimburses for, okay. services and so they Dr. Morris okay. is, she's definitely the master of that she yes. can speak to it but they are self-sustaining okay. and then um, finally our supplement schedule that we are recommending that we, we've collaborated with our, um, our principals and athletic directors to, uh, to really uh, review our supplement schedule make sure that we are um, with with our surrounding uh, counties, is there is there much change in this one from the one from there's from like last year? There's not a lot of change. No, um, the in fact we have uh, I think there was one, and I apologize for not having a, a highlighted <coughs> copy. But we did un we're recommending unfreezing one. Of It's an assistant. Cross country. Uh -huh. I remember that conversation we had. Ms. Amira, that yeah. concern. And then we've also made sure that, that we're equitable across sports yeah. in terms yeah, of uh, <coughs> gender yeah. and in terms of the uh, length of season and, and that sort of thing. So any adjustments that we've made have been to reflect um, equitability across. We do the, still have something frozen, I think. We do. Uh, there are two, I think, that are still frozen. An, an yeah. assistant boys and girls um, mm -hmm. golf, and then uh, an assistant basketball yeah. cheerleading. cheerleading. Mm -hmm. There yeah. are some um, increases in the ranges, and we can actually bring that to your email list. We can even add it in there. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd be, be happy to add it in there. there. Absolutely. What, what changes? Mm -hmm. And I, I will tell you, this is, um, if you don't mind me saying, can I take responsibility? This is a little challenging because um, we one of the budget items that we put before you to consider early on was an increase in supplement um, <clears throat> for our high schools, if you recall. I think we said about $75,000 to be able to expand our supplements. And our, um, after talking with the athletic directors and, and having many conversations with the principals, we, you know, as we know, 
we have coaches who pour their hearts and souls and energies and times and sacrifice their own families. And so we want to do everything in our power to compensate them and support them. We also have to be mindful of fairness and mm -hmm. our teachers work very hard and many of our teachers. So what we decided to do was take the recommendation of our athletic directors and increase some of the supplement ranges to go a little higher. And they have the option based on performance to then increase them over time, but we still put a cap on their total amount. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to prioritize. If you've got a really high performing program, you're going to need to go to the high end of the supplement for that high. But if you've got a new program or player, then you start on the low end, and the total cap mm -hmm. is right at $200,000 per school. And you may or may not have realized that we spend that much, but last year we were right at $400,000 in supplements. So we've given them more flexibility, but increased their ranges so I think that's a very fair way to approach mm -hmm. it. And that helps with the budgeting side of things too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and then they know the ones that they, they need do. to do. That's you right. Know, it doesn't need to be the same for every. That's right. right. That's right. exactly right. Based on program performance mm -hmm. and so forth. So but we'll put that, we'll put the highlight on it. Yes, I'll be happy to yeah. do that. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, and then of course middle school, not to you know, ignore middle sure. school and, and elementary uh, supplements, those are they did not. They didn't change. And then finally, you have the, some job description. Mm -hmm. um, the school nutrition assistant manager uh, job description is a is a new um, job description that's there for your approval. There is a, uh, a director of technology description that is a revision. Um, so remember, we're going through and revising uh, mm -hmm. job descriptions, and we did the bulk of the technology descriptions um, and food service descriptions back in February, but um, these were two that, that we just didn't get to. Well, one we're adding, and then this one we, we did not get to because it was more on the leadership side of things. But our director of technology job description was extremely outdated. And so uh, you don't see any highlighting on this because it really was substantially revised. The whole thing would have been yellow if I had highlighted it. <laughs> so, um, but it does reflect the current work of, of a technology director. And then the last one is um, IT specialist. And this is a job description that we've had, but we, we're just uh, revising it to, um, to add some specific responsibilities around um, around Google and uh, Canvas and some of the more updated applications that we have that um, need to be reflected in, in our roles and responsibilities. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if you um, have those, if you, if you think of anything and
No, I'm sorry, I'm slow. Well, actually, it was at the bottom was, on that thing. You have to scroll down on the Thank fund you. balance sheet. It's, the, it's actually page two of the, um, the one under fund, of course, under general fund. And then I have to rotate Drake a couple times. Okay. So 83% of the year, the top half is the income. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just have to move it quickly mm -hmm. so I don't mess it up again. That's okay. Um, so if we look at the top, that's the revenues that have come in, and we're at 89%. So we're ahead of where we expected to be. And then in expenditures, we're at 82%. So just right on target for this much of the year having passed. I think I hit all my high points. Do you guys have any questions for me? I don't think so. It looks mighty good. I don't know. It, it does look good. To me. It's yeah. very positive. Very. And I, I say this every time, but I have to tell you that I think that while uh, 2009 to 2016, 17 were very challenging times, I think we all learned that um, we have to be very thoughtful and deliberate, mm -hmm. and we're still being very conservative and prioritizing and looking at the return on our investments to make sure that how we're spending our both the teaching and learning across the board have a good return. So I'm grateful. I think that has continued to help us stay in line with where we need to be. So um, the next one there is uh, FY20 budget update. And we were really hoping to be able to be a little further along in terms of making some final recommendations. Just be reminded that by law, we're required to have a tentative budget approved by uh, June, at the end of June. And so um, we'll we're prepared with the exception of um, we don't have a final number from the digest. And you may or may not know that, uh, I'm sure you're aware that Jackson County government unfortunately was hit by the malware. Um, mm -hmm. And it is significantly delaying the tax assessor's office to finalize our tax digest. So our we know what our state revenues are gonna look like. We do not know definitively what our local revenues are gonna look like. We, we have been conservative in our projection but our recommendation right now is that we kind of stay steady until we get that final local tax mm -hmm. digest. And um, if we find that it's increased more than we think, then we can go back to our priority list and evaluate some of those other things that were on our wish list. But right now, you can see what we put in here, and Anna, has, Anna worked on this before she left. Um, if you look at the top, you've got FY19 and FY20. Um, and this is looking at our fund balance. She has a beginning fund balance there of 12 Either way, conservatively, that will be our fund balance. And you can see there are projected increases in that far right column or decreases. And if you just scroll on down, you can see there that we are, even with what we've approved so far right now, which are the, um, you can see in the, I apologize that that got cut off, but that has increased the staffing that you already approved. And then the additional um, positions for the TRS and how all of that is impacting the raise. So the raise is a portion of that. We get some T&E money back from that from the state, but of course there are exponential employer side costs that we will incur. So those are all budgeted in there. And you can see there that we still end next year at 12.9. So we really don't dip into our fund balance at this point, but we break even. We're not, we're not accruing any more fund balance at this point. Below that, you can see the additional positions that were requested that we have not done anything with, that we're just letting sit there um, until we know a little bit more about the, the digest. And at that point, we can decide from those additional personnel, as well as some of the non-personnel budget requests, which of those we may be able to find in that way. Are they giving you any projection as when we might hear that they, they might have that information for us? I think the last time Anna spoke with him, he said he didn't think it would be anytime soon. We normally are they going through the tough times? Yeah, ma'am. <laughs> um, I think I really don't know. We, you know, we did have a time frame prior to Mr. Sargent being our tax assessor that we didn't get our tax digest until almost October one year. We had gotten so much better, and they've worked so hard, and we thank them for that. This is a scenario that's just beyond yeah. their control. So I think they're working as feverishly as they can. To, to make that right. Um, we normally, and we expect, usually hear 
by late April, and then we rebuild and be ready for May, but I think it'll probably be June or July before we get back. So we may not be in a position to, um, but that's why it's a tentative budget. Any it doesn't have to be, but we don't want to spend more than we're going to bring in for sure. <laughs> so. Any questions about the budget as it stands? Or if we get additional, I mean, if we get some additional information in it sooner, that would be great. And we'll call you together and say, okay, we need to make some decisions and make some recommendations. So, uh, the last item there under financial update, um, as you know, um, we've got a process that takes place with a, a bond approval. Last month, we approved uh, the actual vote. You, you saw, you know, you validated the vote. We have two items here for your review. The first one is a um, reimbursement resolution. That simply gives the, the board the ability to get reimbursed from the time the bond is passed. And we don't expect that we'll need that, but legal counsel recommended you already have that in case you should need to. Uh, so that's one resolution. And then the second re resolution is just the validation. Um, but they're both in there for your review and you um, read over them if you have any questions, but I would like to be able to have those as action items for Monday evening. And they're, they're really just protocols and that's the part of the process in terms of validating and reimbursement authorization. So. Next, we have facilities and operations and there's just, they've been taking a nap for a few weeks, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even weather. say that with a straight face. <laughs> I it's right been now. so busy. Yeah. Yeah. Are you watching the weather? Yeah. <laughs> we don't need many more six inches of rain in a uh, four hour type deals. It should be raining in Minutes. 13 minutes and got it down to the science. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. So I'll turn it over to you to start with. I, I do, in a, in, I've said that <coughs> because um, this has been a very busy couple of months. You know that we did have a major rain event. Our entire county mm -hmm. was impacted by it. Mm -hmm. And all things considered, that site held up very well. There, there, it really did, especially considering the amount of rain that we had. We do have a few areas that we're mitigating. To be expected, and we're working with Gina Roy and the planning division, and that everyone that's on, you know, a part of it. So we uh, look forward to next step. So I'll turn it over West Middle Update and High School Update. Uh, I'll mention too, just to remind that our consultants are there virtually every day. Uh, Geo Hydro is there every day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, our uh, construction administrator with Southern A and E is there two to three times a week right now. Civil engineers spent two days yesterday, the day before, all day. So um, lots and lots of activity trying to watch and make sure we correct on site everything that we can. And when you open up 75 acres uh, and we're a mound, it's going to go downhill. So, but we're uh, we're working pretty hard at that. Uh, and talking to Mr. Clarice one day, not too long ago, he suggested that. one uh, for this meeting tonight is uh, essentially as of some things as of today the finances are as of March 31 which is the last pay request pay application that we approved but I I would um, appreciate your feedback not tonight but as you go through it and think about it uh, if this is helpful for you if there's things that aren't in there that you'd rather see uh, this would be a first time it's similar to what I've done in the past and what you'll have is a some notes on current construction, some notes on future construction. You'll see on page three, a monthly funding report. This is on the high school. It, it accounts for everything that we have financially in place right now. Uh, there are no change orders. There, the only thing I could say is uh, on the next page, there's been one use of a miscellaneous allowance that was planned for. It was a governmental fee that uh, the contractor paid. <coughs> What kind of furniture came in today? You said 
Um, it was some tables and chairs and desks. Yeah. We, we did some different furniture options in the room, yeah. a little more mobile. And, uh, and did you all, didn't you have some teachers from East Middle come meet with you and walk through West Middle? They did walk through. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're getting ready to they come for East Meet with us, they just, yeah. they did walk through these. Yeah. yeah, so that when we start planning for the East Middle renovation, they have some uh, ideas and options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and Mr. Patton worked with We have been, uh, to our advantage, that uh, Brazelton Fine Baking has been our tenant now for some months at the former West Jackson Primary School. Uh, they pay us rent, and equally as important, they pay all utilities for that facility, electricity, water, and sewer. And that's averaging about $2,500 a month. Mm -hmm. um, so this has been quite good for us. It's been good for uh, the operation there as well, his. The, uh, the growth in what he's doing as a wholesale baker is, has not moved quite as quickly and as, as he hoped. And he asked if we would, uh, rather than in the second renewal, move now to 3000 a month, if we would hold it to 2250 per month for another six months and then reassess after that. And I think it's a great idea. Uh, this helps us have somebody on site in that building every day. Our insurers are grateful his own insurance. So we recommend that you uh, approve that modification and then we'll look at it again in six months if that's acceptable. And any questions you might have, I can take now or later uh, before Monday. Uh, he's really good. And I noticed he's uh, has some donations to the, uh, the race for life tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. uh, gifts or tickets, uh, yeah. cookies or something. Yeah. Yeah. Smells good. <laughs> and then uh, do you want to do the intergovernmental agreement? Sure, we can do that together. Mm -hmm. okay. Just as I'm doing that, speaking of intergovernmental agreements, um, reminder that Relay for Life is tomorrow night. And, uh, that's been a hot topic this week, trying to figure out whether we're going to have to host it outside or inside. And um, we are scheduled to have it at West Jackson Middle School at the um, field there. I guess you call it turf field. <laughs> great it's easily accessible we had it at Jackson County one year and the fact that that's so low it's part of the low stuff up and down that hill in West Middle became a very good site and so lots more participation from the teams this year and looking forward to that I think the decision was made this afternoon to go ahead and plan for it outside there's going to be a gap and, and um, we will look forward to that so one of our governmental agreements that um, we recently I would say recently in the past five years uh, agreed to was the development of the 17 acres in exchange for the development of the turf field. So we have 17 acres that the Board of Commissioners will be moving forward um, in the next couple of years. I don't know exactly what their timeline is, but they're going to develop fields there. they got a long-term lease on that 17 acres that belongs to us. Uh, but the reason the whole um, intergovernmental agreement came up, we're again, as we recognize, the economy has turned around. We're in a good place. We've got growth happening, but we also have to be very thoughtful in planning. You're probably aware that Jackson County Board of Commissioners are in the process of uh, planning for the construction of an ag facility. They're also planning for um, the maintenance and operation of that facility. And so they've reached out to the three school systems um, and asked if each of the school systems would partner in making a contribution to supporting the operations of the facility on an annual basis. And so I've put in here um, a, a, an MOU basically that says what they're asking decided who paid what based on student enrollment, so the size of the school, uh, school system, and so our, I believe our amount was about $10,000 a year, and that is, that is to um, run, this, basically to run the ag facility, uh, to help run the ag facility, and then of course Jefferson City and Commerce City have an ask as well. So I, I bring this to you uh, for your consideration, uh, but I also felt like it was important that we all be reminded, um, welcome sir, um, we all be, and I might ask Todd if he can make sure he can access. Um, 
we be in consideration of all of the partnerships that exist. So Ted, um, <coughs> Ted and Josh um, went through our agreements, and I don't think I have it in here, do I not? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the second click, um, you will see the agreements that we presently have with the board, of and we reference the board of commissioners, but that includes anyone who falls under the board of commissioners, like the right department. <laughs> the right department falls under the board of commissioners uh, oversight. So you can see there the agreements that we have, the date that those were established, when the terms are, and when they're up for renewal, um, and approximately what they cost the school district and or um, the, the right department of board of commissioners. This is a high-level overview so that you can see. Um, I think it's important that the board be aware, for our new board members especially, that um, we do have a strong partnership with the Rec Department. And Jackson County Schools facilities really are the Rec Department in terms of gyms. And uh, we, be, as you know, we partnered with them so that Gordon Street's gym is now a part of their, for lack of a better word, inventory. Um, but all of our gyms are also used by the board of um, the, by the board of commissioners or the rec department. So um, right now, there is no exchange of funds for the use of gyms. Um, it's an agreement. We extend that, um, and we know that we are all serving the same kids for the most part. You know, the rec department. But I wanted you to be aware of what they're presently using our facilities for, and we presume that we'll be using their facilities. We still have our ag barn, you know, right here, um, it, it, and it's, it certainly accommodates our needs immediately, but there will be increased needs. So I'd like for you to consider this MOU and the uh, consideration for supporting the um, maintenance and operation of that. But then I also think as a school system, we need to be mindful of, do we need to look at how we support the facilities in general, if that makes sense. So any questions you can see there, it's, I think it's Great job. Yes, sir. Quick clarification. On the um, on that grounds maintenance where it says that JC Jackson County does the grounds maintenance, that would just be inside the fence. The um, whole whole seven acres. Field. No, it's on, on the grid. on the bottom grid here. Um, where it says they do the ground maintenance and that's it. I didn't want anybody to be misled by that because all they do is inside the fence and it's just during the season that they're using. Okay. Right. But, so any other time we're doing all of that. Okay. Yeah. And the gym core refinish is a, essentially a sand and re coat mm -hmm. uh, at about $1,500 per time per year I mean, from the two gyms. So mm -hmm. it seemed appropriate that as we think about facilities that we just give you context of what's happening now. So every gym and a lot of fields are in use, which is a good thing. It's our kids. Yeah. Um, but, but but you will want some of the um, some of the most challenging conversations to be honest with you that we have and rightfully so with our own folks is how do we maintain our field? Right. How I mean our own coaches are cutting the grass and they they're um, the that, that is a piece that we really have to honestly cons continue to consider because we do have a lot of fields that are used by a lot of folks. Um, but right now, for the most part, Jackson County School Board is paying to maintain all of that other than um, the, the two fields that they, they help us with, as well as the resurfacing of all the other large gym floors that we do on a regular basis. So, um, I'd be interested in talking about options. Right. I, think, uh, I think we just need to look at it comprehensively and it's, it's a good time to do that because we have new facilities coming online and I think a revisit and, a, and an understanding by all parties would be helpful. So um, we'll make sure. One of the things that I mentioned to Ms. Wheeler, um, and, and I have mentioned this to our county manager, Mr. Kevin Poe, they're very busy right now as everybody, but in the fall they have a, a retreat for the Board of Commissioners and we'd like to do some preliminary planning between now and then and have Board of Commissioners and Board of Education have a joint meeting and just begin to really have some intergovernmental conversations as well. I think it's important because we're overlapping in many, many areas and the more we can be efficient with um, our community's dollars and investments and use them, the better off we'll be. So that's just for you to have and um, 
you consider this agreement, and uh, we can you can let me know how you feel about it. And uh, prior to Monday, whether or not you want it to be on the agenda, or if you want us to hold off and talk about it, it's, that is completely your decision. So. What about the lease modification? We're gonna for the West Jackson primary school. Yes. That would be. It's an action item. It would be an action item on Monday. to the budget right before you texted and said you were headed this way and I updated them that we are just I texted you and you put the pedal down to the metal <laughs> and made it over. Just before. Bo told me he was going to filibuster and we're going to get the best out of number one so I put my phone on silent. <laughs> so um, we did talk about the fact that we are we don't have any more information today than we did when we met in April because just um, delay a little bit and so our recommendation right now is to hold steady and to not add anything to the budget until we have a little bit more information so we are open to any questions or you you're welcome to come in tomorrow or monday and talk anybody's always welcome to do that if you've got questions or thoughts if you want real detail then we would have to make sure Aaron can be with us or wait till monday when Aaron gets back um, i mean i have all the detail but i don't have the, the staff right now <laughs> <laughs> Second. Okay, a second. Second. All right. Should be the five or ten minutes.